Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Ryan, cardiologist at the University of Connecticut Health Center, and welcome to Heart Talk Healthcare Professional Module 3, the six key recommendations for patients with chronic heart failure. Before we talk about teaching patients, two points are important. You should make sure that whatever you teach your patient is consistent with their doctor's prescribed plan of care. You don't want to tell your patient anything that's contradictory to their doctor's advice. Second, make sure you comply with your state's licensure regulations and scope of practice guidelines. Your state may have rules or regulations that limit what nurses and other healthcare professionals can and cannot tell to patients. You want to make sure you operate within these regulations. Heart failure is complex. It requires medications, procedures, and doctor visits to keep the condition stable. Complicating this is that many people with heart failure have other comorbidities like lung disease, kidney disease, or coronary disease, just to name a few. Patients need a straightforward, simplified set of instructions to help them manage this complex situation. And that's the point of this video series, to give you six key recommendations that you can pass on to your patients to help them self-manage this very complicated condition. The six recommendations are to take medications as prescribed, to ensure physician follow-up appointments, to monitor symptoms and weight, to adapt diet and fluids, to promote exercise and activity, and to limit alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco use. We'll go through each of these recommendations in this video series and talk about why each one is so important. The first recommendation is to take medications as prescribed. You should teach your patients that they need to take their medicines even when they feel well. And I like to tell the story of a patient of mine who was in her mid-80s and had been well all her life until she was hospitalized for an infection. During the hospitalization, she was put on medicines for blood pressure. About two months later, when I saw her, I said, how's the blood pressure treatment going? And she said, I finished it. Uh, and when I asked her, what do you mean you finished it? She said, well, I took the medicines for two months. That was all they gave me. And you can see that from her point of view, this is actually a very logical thing to think. All her life she had been well, the only medicines she had ever taken were antibiotics, and she thought that two months of blood pressure treatment would cure her condition. So things that are common knowledge to us that we talk about every day may not be common knowledge to our patients, so you need to go through this with them, and taking their medications every day is one of them. And the way I make this easy for my patients is telling them that by taking their medicines every day, they'll live longer, feel better, and spend less time in the hospital, and these are really the things that are most important to them. You should review carefully the medications with your patient and how and when to take them. And there are some basic things that you should check. Can they afford their medications? How will they obtain their medications? Many patients with heart failure don't drive, and they need to think about this ahead of time so that they don't find themselves in a situation where they don't have their medicines and they have no way to get them. You should consider requesting a pharmacist to review their medications. Here at the University of Connecticut Health Center, we have a pharmacist meet with the majority of our heart failure patients, and this is particularly useful for patients with multiple comorbidities or a new diagnosis of heart failure. Also, you should consider a social worker evaluation in certain cases, particularly when there are issues around transportation or paying for medicines. It's important to review with patients how to refill their medicines. Too many patients, unfortunately, wait until the bottle is completely empty to call their doctor's office. The time delay until they get a refill could lead to them getting sick. They need to know to call their doctor's office early and to stay ahead of their medication refills. This next point is very important. You should tell patients to bring their medicines or a list of their medicines with them to their doctor appointment. One of the hardest things for me as a practicing cardiologist is when my patients come to the office and they're not sure what they're taking. And this unfortunately happens all too often. I tell my patients to just push their medicines into a brown paper bag and bring them with them. This is one of the most helpful things they can do. And finally, you should tell patients to notify their doctor of any potential side effect. A lot of patients will stop a medicine on their own if they believe they're getting a symptom from it. Sometimes the symptom may not even be from that drug. Most side effects are treatable, so if patients are told ahead of time what side effects to expect and to tell their doctor, you can avoid having periods of time where they stop their drugs. The second recommendation is to arrange physician follow-up appointments. Close follow-up after discharge is critical for maintaining health. We have learned that the time period from when a patient leaves the hospital until they get reestablished in their home setting several weeks later is a vulnerable period. And during that window, a lot of patients get sick again and come back in the hospital. So follow-up appointments are very important, and patients need to know that they have to go to these appointments whether they feel well or not. 
And again, just like with medications, I emphasize to my patients that follow-up appointments help them feel better, live longer, and stay out of the hospital. These are the things that they want, and I tie them as closely as I can to the physician follow-up appointment. You can help your patients comply by scheduling the appointment before they leave the hospital or extended care facility. When you tell patients to go home and call the doctor, it often doesn't happen. It's far better if they leave with a date and time in their hand for the appointment. You should schedule the appointment on the best day and time for them. If it's scheduled on a day that's inconvenient, there's a high chance they won't make it to the appointment and this could lead to them getting sick. Make sure they have a ride to their appointments, particularly for patients who don't drive. Encourage them to bring a friend or family member. There's a lot of information covered at visits and having a second person there as an advocate is helpful. Advise them to bring all their medications with them or an accurate medication list, just like we talked about in the last section. Encourage them to ask questions. Too many patients are uncomfortable asking their doctor questions and they feel like they shouldn't, but actually the, their doctor is there to help and they need to feel empowered to get the information they need because heart failure is a disease where the patient needs to play a role in self-management. So make sure you make it as explicit to them as possible that asking questions is okay and even encouraged. And finally, consider a social worker evaluation in certain cases, particularly if the patients are having a very hard time getting to their doctor's appointments. The third recommendation is to monitor symptoms and wait. Heart failure has a classic triad of symptoms and patients should be aware of this and should notify their doctor if any of them occur. The triad is shortness of breath, swelling in the legs, ankles, or uh, lower extremities, which we call edema, and unusual extreme fatigue. Weight gain is one of the most important things for heart failure patients to monitor for if they're going to self-manage their condition. We know from lots of studies that weight gain occurs about two weeks before patients begin to develop symptoms. As patients start to get sick and heart failure, they retain fluid, and the result is their weight goes up when they stand on the scale. By weighing themselves every day, patients with heart failure can avoid a decline in status. In fact, I tell my patients that the scale is like an early warning system of you starting to get sick, and if you're monitoring that, you can stop things before they make you feel so unwell that you end up in the emergency room. Obtaining a daily weight is one of the most important ways for heart failure patients to stay well. Here are some tips to give your patients so they can effectively weigh themselves every day. They should weigh themselves every morning at about the same time, after urinating, before having anything to drink, in the same amount of clothing, and on the same scale. And I give them a very simple rule of thumb for when to notify me. I tell them to call me if they get a three pound weight gain in one day or a five pound weight gain in one week. These increases are too large to be explained by anything but fluid retention, and most times this means the patient needs to have a higher dose of diuretic or come and see me in the office. So again, I hit this point with the patients just like in the previous sections. I tell them by monitoring for symptoms and weight gain, they can stay free of symptoms and out of the hospital, which is what they want. Other tips for helping your patients comply. Don't assume anything. Start with the basics. Ask if they have a scale at home. Many patients will nod their head to you and say that they'll weigh themselves every day and only after a second or third hospitalization will you find that they don't have a scale. Make sure they can see the numbers on the scale, particularly for elderly patients who may have trouble with vision. Explain the importance of daily weight so that they can have buy-in to the process and understand why they're doing it. Encourage them to keep a weight chart. My best patients keep a chart, uh, 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 chart of their weight and bring it in with them at every visit, and I can quickly go back and see what their weight's done since the last time they saw me. This is extremely helpful. Monitoring the symptoms of heart failure and the weight can be confusing for patients, so we try to simplify them by teaching them the zones, and we've had great success with teaching heart failure patients the zone system here at the University of Connecticut Health Center. The zone system involves the patient self-evaluating for symptoms and weight and then determining whether they're in the green, yellow, or red zone, and based on which zone they're in, they take the appropriate action. We'll go through it now so you can understand how it works. Patients are in the green zone when they have no shortness of breath, no weight gain of more than three pounds per day, no swelling of the feet, ankles, legs, or stomach, and no chest pain. And when they're in the green zone, we tell them to keep up the good work. This is where we want them to be most days. We tell them to take their medicines, stick to a low-salt diet, and keep weighing themselves every day. Patients are in the yellow zone when they have a weight gain of 3 pounds in a day or 5 pounds in a week. They may have more shortness of breath, more swelling in their feet, ankles, legs, or stomach. They may feel more tired, have new or unusual coughing, have dizziness, or they may find it hard to breathe lying down. In fact, they may need to sleep sitting in a chair. 
And the yellow zone is when we want them to call their doctor or nurse. The yellow zone is often a place where patients are starting to get sick, but they're not sick enough that they require the emergency room. If they notify their doctor or nurse and an intervention is taken, such as giving them a higher dose of diuretic, you often can get them back into that green zone and keep them out of the hospital. Patients are in the red zone when they're having a hard time breathing, struggling to breathe even at rest, when they have chest pain or discomfort, or they feel faint. And patients in the red zone may be in the midst of a medical emergency, so we urge them to call 911 or get help as soon as possible. So by teaching your patients the zone system, you can empower them to self-manage, and it really helps them simplify a complex set of symptoms and other things that they're monitoring so that they can quickly know how well they're doing and take the appropriate action. The fourth recommendation is to adapt diet and fluids. Salt is the same thing as sodium, and most healthcare professionals are familiar with the word sodium, but many patients are not. So if you're going to teach your patients how to monitor how much salt they eat every day, you need to make sure they understand what the word sodium means. Salt intake will be matched by the body with fluid retention, and because of this, high salt intake leads to swelling and heart failure symptoms. So by sticking to a low salt diet, patients can feel well and stay out of the hospital. Some common dietary salt sources are listed on this slide. Soups, in particular canned soups, are loaded with salt. So are frozen TV dinners, hot dogs, and deli meat. And these four things on this slide are the places where my patients most commonly get into trouble. Some other dietary salt sources are listed on this slide. Sea salt has salt in it, sometimes because it says it's from the sea, patients think it might be okay, but it's not. Adobo seasoning is a seasoning used in dishes of Spanish or Caribbean origin. Salad dressings, cheeses, and soy sauce all have lots of salt. So does jarred tomato or pasta sauce. Also pickles, sausages and kielbasa, ham and bacon, and french fries. If you find patients are having a lot of trouble keeping the fluid off, you should carefully go through their diet and you'll often find one of the things on this list or the last list is the culprit for why they're retaining fluid. I advise my patients to eat a low salt diet and I recommend they aim for less than 2,000 milligrams a day. I explain that sodium is the same thing as salt and I review the sources. I also emphasize that salt leaves, leads to heart failure symptoms. And it's very important to speak to the person who buys and cooks the food, especially for elderly patients. They may have their food cooked by someone else. They may be living in a facility where the food is delivered to them. So going over all this won't do any good unless the people who prepare the food are aware. You should determine your patient's ability and willingness to comply with low salt eating. Make sure they can read labels, do they understand the sources of salt, can they afford healthy food choices, and are there cultural issues leading to high salt, salt intake. Some patients are used to a certain lifestyle with a high salt intake that they've been following for decades. It's going to be very hard for them to stop this just because they've developed heart failure. So you need to understand this about your patient when you give them advice. And I encourage my patients to tell me about their compliance. If they can't stick to the low salt diet, all is not lost. I can give them higher dosages of diuretics to try and match their salt intake and keep them out of heart failure, but they need to be honest. I try not to be too rigid with my recommendations for salt. I set the 2,000 milligram number as a goal, but not something they must strictly adhere to. And then I try to work with them to find the right balance between low salt eating and medical therapy to keep them out of heart failure. Finally, a nutrition consult can be very helpful here, and we use this frequently in the hospital and even in the clinic to help our patients understand what they should eat. When patients eat out with heart failure, this is where they often get into trouble. And if you work in a hospital, a common scenario is a patient admitted with heart failure one or two days after eating out, oftentimes at a Chinese restaurant or some other place where they ate a high salt meal. You can tell them that when they eat out, they should choose baked or broiled foods whenever possible. They can ask for salad dressing, sauce, and gravy on the side so that they don't have to load their dishes up with it. And there are some safe dishes like baked chicken, fish, or steamed vegetables that are often very low in salt. Finally, you should discuss fluid restrictions with your patient when necessary. Fluid restrictions are luckily something we don't have to do frequently in heart failure, but occasionally we do, and you need to go over with your patients how to monitor how much fluid they're taking in. Heart failure patients need to know how to read a label if they're going to stick to a low salt diet, and it's important to go through this carefully with them because many have not done this before. If you look at the label on the screen, you'll see it says that there are 190 milligrams per serving. This might lead a patient to believe that they could eat the entire package and only eat 190 milligrams of salt. However, if you look at the top, you'll see there are 12 servings per container. 
So if the patient ate this entire container, they would actually eat 12 times 190 milligrams, which would be far in excess of the recommended daily amount of salt. It's important that patients understand this and don't get fooled by reading the labels and looking at the amount per serving and confusing it with the amount per container. And again, this is another situation where nutrition consultation can be helpful to carefully go over diet restrictions with patients. The fifth recommendation is to promote exercise and activity. Specific activity levels for a heart failure patient have to be determined by their doctor. There are special circumstances where it's dangerous for heart failure patients to exercise. So before you give any exercise recommendations to your patient, check with their doctor. However, you should know that for the vast majority of heart failure patients, exercise is generally safe and in fact quite beneficial to their condition. If appropriate, cardiac rehab is also a safe and effective way for patients to exercise, and I really like this option for my patients who have been relatively sedentary for most of their life. At cardiac rehab, they'll get special attention from an exercise physiologist who will help them develop an exercise program. And a lot of patients will ask about sexual activity and driving. Just like with other exercise, they have to check with their doctor because there are special cases where these activities aren't safe. But for the majority of patients, they're completely okay uh, and will not cause any harm whatsoever. The sixth recommendation is to limit alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco use. Patients need to check with their doctor about alcohol and caffeine because just like with exercise, there are some special circumstances where these aren't safe. However, in general, alcohol and caffeine are okay as long as they're consumed in moderation. Alcohol should be consumed less than two drinks per day for men or one for women, and caffeine should be consumed less than one or two cups per day. And tobacco is definitely bad. It's bad for anyone, but it's especially bad for patients uh, with heart failure. If your patients smoke, they should stop. Uh, there are many reasons to do this. These include the fact that uh, tobacco and smoking cause the heart rate to increase. They can elevate the blood pressure. They can deprive the heart of oxygen. They can trigger blood clots, and they can make the cholesterol levels become abnormal. You should counsel and provide resources that are available at your facility to patients to quit smoking. If you find a heart failure patient who smokes, quitting smoking is one of the best things they can do for their condition. Finally, a note about standardizing education. Patients receive care from multiple settings at the hospital, the nursing facility, from a VNA or a home care, also in a physician's office. And each point of care is an education opportunity. And you should consider forming a community team to coordinate care because the more patients hear the same information, the more likely they will be to retain the knowledge. Here at the Yukon Health Center, we hold a monthly community meeting of nursing facilities, visiting nurses, and physicians, and we try to get everyone teaching the same things to their patients so that they hear it again and again, and we increase the chances that they'll retain the information and be able to follow our recommendations. So let's review the six recommendations for heart failure patients. Take medicines as prescribed, ensure physician follow-up appointments, monitor symptoms and weight, adapt diet and fluids, promote exercise and activity, limit alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco use. Remember that heart failure is very complicated and it can be confusing to patients, but if you can boil it down to these six recommendations and emphasize why each one is important, you can empower your patients to self-manage, and that's really the key of this video series. When patients begin self-managing their condition, that's how they do well in the long run. Thank you very much.